All right, so we are now recording. Let's go ahead and get the slideshow put up and then we'll be ready to rock. Looks like we're ready to go. So uh, I wanna start by thanking you guys for joining us today. This is the first of a four part webinar series that we will be doing here at Aptricity. Uh, today we'll be talking about tagging technologies for your supply chain. So we've got a lot of good information for you guys. So again, thank you for joining. Uh, I did mention we are recording this. So if you would like a copy of this just for future reference, uh, reach out to one of us here. You can reach out to me, uh, Susan Timmons, our director of marketing, uh, anybody on our team, and we'll get you a copy of this. So this will also be available on YouTube if you want to go check it out there. So um, like I said, you've got multiple options if you want to review this at some point. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. So I'll start by giving a brief overview on what to expect in this webinar, just a little bit of a timeline on what we're going to be doing. And so essentially what I'll do is I'll introduce myself, I'll introduce the company, a little bit about who we are, and then I'll talk about the future webinar series. As I mentioned, this is a four-part series. So this is part one of the four-part series. So I'll talk a little bit about those dates and those topics as well. And then we'll dive into really the, the bulk of the presentation, which is tagging technologies for your supply chain. We will then do a Q&A session at the end, and then we'll... Um, reserve some time there just to go over any questions that you may have, and then we will close and dismiss. Um, we would ask if you could keep your mic muted. Uh, since we are recording this, we don't want to get too much uh, external audio if possible. And then also, uh, if you have questions, save them to the end. Uh, we're going to be using the chat in Zoom to do our Q&A session. So if you have questions, uh, just keep them until the end and then type them out, and then we'll we'll go through a few of those as we have time. Uh, obviously, everyone's time is very valuable, so we won't go through 50 questions, uh, but we want to make sure that if you do have uh, questions about today's uh, today's topic, that uh, we can answer those for you. And if for some reason we don't get to those within this session, um, we'd be happy to reach out and chat one-on-one -on -one, uh, via email, or we could potentially set up another meeting to go over any questions that we did not address. So without further ado... Um, well, we've got one more intro topic, and then we'll then we'll get into the meat and potatoes. Um, so I'll introduce myself, and then I'll introduce Aptricity. So my name is Christian Garcia. I'm a product manager here at Aptricity. I work on the supply chain execution uh, software side of things. Uh, that includes enterprise asset management, enterprise inventory management, and field service management. And so we have uh, cloud-based web applications for both web and mobile platforms. And uh, we've been in this business for a long time. Uh, Aptricity has been in the supply chain business for over 20 years. Uh, we work very closely with uh, government agencies like the U.S. Army. We work with the Air Force as well. And on the commercial side, we work with customers like Verizon and Brinks. And so we've got a large, um, a large list of customers that go up and down the scale of size. And so we, we have a lot of experience in the supply chain world. Uh, we wanted to do this webinar series really to help uh, explain some of these things that may be a little bit confusing on their own, but just give you an opportunity to understand um, just what's out there and what's possible for managing your supply chain. I think uh, if you're if you're paying attention at all, even even just a little bit, you'd know that supply chain issues are a big deal right now. And so uh, we wanted to use this webinar series as an opportunity to share some of our expertise and then maybe answer some questions that you may have. So that's a little bit about who we are. Uh, we'll do a little bit of an overview on the webinar series. So obviously today is session one. We're going to be talking about tagging technologies for your supply chain. Uh, the next session, which uh, just a little bit of an overview, each of these webinars will be on a Wednesday at 1030 Central. So we'll be keeping things uh, pretty consistent in that regard. I'm going to let somebody in real quick. And then I'll continue my diatribe. Uh, so today's session one, we're going to be talking about tagging technologies for your supply chain. Next, uh, not next week, but two weeks from now, we'll be doing a overview on indoor positioning. So basically everything that you need to know. Uh, the session after that is August 10th, and we'll be talking about uh, an industry spotlight for indoor positioning. So we'll be going over some of the specific industries that could benefit from an indoor positioning system. And then finally on uh, August 24th, that'll be our final webinar. And that's just gonna be kind of a wrap up of uh, the supply chain tracking technologies. It'll be a bit of a culmination of the sessions that we've done before, and we'll go through and uh, potentially answer any other questions that may have come up from other webinar series or sessions, rather. So that's 
an overview on what we're doing for the webinar, but today's webinar is about tagging technologies for your supply chain. And we wanted to start with this topic because there are a lot of options that you can choose. And there's a lot of buzz terms that, that fly around that uh, if you're not in it every day like we are, it can be a bit confusing to really understand, hey, where do I need to start? What's the difference between RFID and barcode? Or when would I need to use a cellular tag versus a satellite tag? And so there's a lot of those types of questions that we get that we decided we wanted to host a webinar to help that information or to help share that information with you. And so today's topic, we're going to be talking about how you can connect your valuable assets and inventory items to the Internet of Things. I think we've heard a lot of information, a lot of topics about the Internet of Things, and we get a lot of questions. What is the Internet of Things? And it really is exactly what it sounds like. It is all things connected to the Internet. It's very simple. Uh, my, my watch is connected to the internet. You know, some people have refrigerators that are connected to the internet. I personally don't understand that, but you know, maybe you just need to get on and see what's in, you know, what's in your refrigerator, but that is the internet of things. It's just all things connected to the internet. And so what we do at Electricity is we utilize the internet of things to connect valuable assets and inventory. And that could be anything that could be heavy equipment. It could be tools. It could be computers, it could be perishable inventory items, it could be literally anything that you could slap a tag on. That's what we're connecting to the Internet of Things. And what we found is that having access to that data helps you make informed decisions. And a lot of those decisions are time critical. Uh, the example that I love to use is uh, grocery, cold chain. There are strict temperature regulations on things like produce. And if, if produce goes above or below a certain temperature, then it can spoil. And then that whole shipment becomes useless. And so we like to use Internet of Things enabled technology to gather that information, to then present that in a software solution that allows you to make quick, actionable decisions that are based off of real-time data, not based off of hunches or, or maybe things that may have happened in the past. And so when we talk about the Internet of Things, that's what we're going to be doing with these tags. We're going to be tagging virtually anything so that data can be transferred between the things you're tracking to a cloud-hosted solution. And so when we talk about tagging technologies, I think where everybody likes to start is with barcode, right? We know what barcode is. It's been around for a long time. Virtually everything that we buy has a barcode on it. I would almost go as far as to say that everything we buy has a barcode on it. And this is a tagging technology. It's the very basic unit uh, in the spectrum of tags that we'll be covering today. Um, but really what we're going to be discussing more at length today is how do I move beyond barcode? And, and what really is available out there that I can be tracking? Obviously, things like barcode can't really give you temperature, right? A barcode is just a list of numbers and, and potentially letters. But once we start introducing these new technologies, you get access to sensor technology. And that's really the big part of tagging technology that we like to push is you get access to all these sensors and all this data that you can collect that's very valuable. And so that's really what we're gonna be talking about is, you know, how can I move past barcode? Maybe you'd be thinking about that question uh, if your industry or your business is at the barcode level, how do I move past that? So we'll be uh, talking about that a little bit as well. And we've really boiled down the three questions about tracking tags. We boiled it down into three questions, I should say. If you wanna learn about a tag, what it's capable of doing, how it communicates. There's three questions that we will address. And let's start with question number one. Is it active or passive? And this question essentially just helps you determine if it has a battery or not. Uh, if we were to use our barcode example, obviously a barcode doesn't have a battery, right? The only way that you can scan or to get information from a barcode is if you scan it. And so that's how we have these to find out. An active tag is battery powered and it can report on its own. It doesn't need any sort of external uh, prompting or scan or anything like that. It, it can report on its own. A passive tag is non-powered. It does re require a scan in order to work. But with that in mind, we do wanna make the caveat that just because a tag is active and has a battery does not necessarily mean that it can directly connect to the cloud. And so we have a couple of graphics that we're going to show to explain really the three scenarios that you get with active and passive tags. 
So we'll start with our passive tagging technology. And essentially how this works is you have a tag, you scan the tag, but there needs to be that way to get that scan from the scanner to the cloud, right? So in the middle here, we have uh, one of the many scanners that we integrate with, it's a zebra scanner. And the way that that scanner works is it connects via Bluetooth to a smart device. And if you're using our mobile app, you could scan that tag and then using the internet connectivity of your smartphone, that scan information will get sent to our cloud. And so that's essentially how passive tagging works. Something in the middle there, and we're gonna focus on the middle part of this graphic, something in the middle has to be able to scan and then send that information to the cloud in order for that tagging technology to work. And so it may sound like I'm overcome or I'm, I'm talking a little bit too much about this. You may already understand this, but this is essentially how passive tagging works. When we move into active tagging, this scenario really focuses more on Bluetooth beacons because Bluetooth tags have their own battery, but they can't directly connect to the internet. And in this case, we have in the middle, we have again, a smart device and we have a mobile application that, that reads Bluetooth tags for tracking purposes. The way that Bluetooth works, I, I know that Bluetooth is a technology much like barcode that we, we mostly understand that in, in some regard, it's a part of our lives, right? Whether it's in your car, your watch, your headphones uh, or whatever the case may be. But the way that Bluetooth technology works is that a Bluetooth tag or a beacon will send its signal out and your phone or smart device will read that signal. It will make a quick pairing to exchange data and then using the phone or the smart device's internet connectivity, it'll then send that information from the tag to the cloud, right? I'm using cloud and, and internet interchangeably, right? We mentioned how actually we have cloud hosted solutions and that's essentially how, how it works on our end. We collect the data, send it to the cloud, right? But the key takeaway here is that Bluetooth tags cannot directly connect to the internet and they do still require that scanner much like passive technology. But once we get into, when we get more into Bluetooth, I'll explain kind of the difference between a Bluetooth tag and a passive RFID tag, because uh, there will be some questions around that. The last active type of tag is one that can directly connect to the cloud. So what we have pictured here is one of our uh, LTE tags that we use uh, for tracking um, things like heavy equipment, big, uh, big expensive items. And these tags have a SIM chip built into them. And I'll talk a little bit more about these tags um, as we get to them uh, later in the webinar, but these tags can be configured to directly report their information to the cloud. So you'll notice there's really no middleman here uh, because this tag can connect to the internet and it is battery powered, it's an active tag. Uh, this can just immediately send its information to the cloud. So like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about that in further detail as we go. But let's get into question two. Questions two and three really to me make up the important questions about tagging technology. Um, and question two is how does it communicate? And once again, some of these questions may seem a little simple or maybe the answers may seem a little, well, like a little, uh, you know, no brainer-ish, if you will. Um, but it is important to help you understand how the tag works. So how does it communicate? The question tells you, hey, how does this tag communicate its information? Uh, with barcode and RFID, you scan the tag, you get the information. Pretty simple, right? Talk a little bit about Bluetooth, right? You create a pairing and then it exchanges information between the tag and the device. And then for the LTE cellular and then satellite tags, they have direct connection to the cloud, right? So we're gonna, we'll go to question three and then I'll kind of paint the full picture of how to describe a tag and what it can do. So let's move to question three. Question three, what is being communicated? This is probably the most important of the three questions because this is where you're starting to keep track of what data is actually being reported, what data is being gathered, right? And this is where we start to talk about IoT sensor technology. And so I was actually recently at a conference in Las Vegas. It was the RFID Live Journal. And a lot of the manufacturers or, or booths that were there were displaying some of this new sensor technology that's out there. And I have a list of some examples. Uh, GPS, that's something pretty common. I think we all understand how GPS works. But some of these new sensor companies are releasing 
these sensors that can be built into tags and they, they measure things like temperature. Uh, they can measure light. They can measure fill levels, if you're talking about liquid, uh, vibration. And then there's, there's multiple other examples. Um, if you, I don't know if you have uh, any, any experience, you as in the audience, uh, with insurance companies that give you those tags that you plug into your car. And it basically monitors how safe of a driver you are. Uh, I'm glad that I personally don't have one of those because I would probably be losing money on my insurance if I did. But those tags can measure things like harsh braking, harsh acceleration. So they're measuring G-force, right? And so all of these are sensor types that can be built into tags. And they're essentially just sensing information about their surroundings and storing that information within the tag. So if we take a look at the full spectrum, of we're, we're going to ask a question about a tag. And I'm going to use, let's use a Bluetooth tag that has a temperature sensor. And we're going to answer the three questions, right? Question one, is it active or passive? Well, Bluetooth tag is active. It has its own power source. How is it communicating? It's communicating through a Bluetooth pairing. What is it communicating? It's communicating its temperature, the surrounding temperature. So it's communicating through Bluetooth and it's communicating temperature, right? And I think that's a, that's a distinction that you need to make because people will say, oh, uh, RFID tags, you know, people can keep track of me with RFID tags. Well, not necessarily. It, it, people can keep track of you if you have GPS, right? RFID is just a, a, a way of communication, right? It's not actual information that's being tracked. So that's the distinction, right? Question one, active or passive? That basically covers, does it have a battery or not? Question two, how is it communicating? Is it communicating through RFID? Is it communicating through LTE? Is it communicating through barcode scan? And then question three, what's being communicated? So those three questions really wrap up what the, the questions that will help you understand a tag and exactly what it can do. So moving on, let's talk about the different tag types. You probably already heard me mention them to some extent. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into what these tags are. We'll go into some examples and then talk about some pros and cons about each. So the five tag types are barcode, RFID, and I have RFID in parentheses as passive. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. RFID does come in active and passive, um, but like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to RFID. Uh, Bluetooth low energy, also known as BLE. LTE and cellular, and satellite. So those make up the five major uh, tag types that you can use for tracking. So let's we'll start with barcode. I think this is one, like I said, we're all pretty familiar with, right? I kind of started by saying this is technology that everybody understands. It's, it's one that we use frequently. And there's not really too much explaining I need to do about it, right? It's very common. Uh, some examples of barcodes, 2D, which is just the basic uh, barcode that you'll see there on the right image. Uh, 3D barcodes, which is actually, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, new technology where people are engraving barcodes into, into different products, which I think is pretty cool. And then QR codes. QR codes are a type of barcode. And obviously it's a passive tag. It doesn't have a battery. And let's go into the pros. I and mean, they're, they're cheap. They're, they're virtually free. I mean, you can go to a barcode generator and print free barcodes if you want to. Uh, and they're easy to slap onto something, simply. I mean, it's, like I said, we all understand barcodes. There's not too much left to, to describe about it. But really, the cons of barcodes are you're limited to line of sight. So in order to do any sort of data transfer, you actually have to actually go and scan the tag to, you know, to get information from it. And so you have to make a direct connection. Think about being in a warehouse or if, you, if you've ever worked in a retail store. I worked at a sporting goods store for my first job. And when we had to do product inventory, we had to get up on ladders and go scan things on the top shelf. And that's hard to do, right? It takes time. Uh, and you're just limited on the information you can track. I mean, barcodes can be letters and numbers and that's it. And if those letters and numbers mean something to you, great. If they don't, then they're pretty much useless, right? Although I don't know why you would ever have a barcode that doesn't mean anything. So moving on to number two, RFID is really what I would consider to be the the, the enhanced and improved barcode. Uh, this was a technology for a long time that was described as a, a solution looking for a problem. And I think that now uh, the, the industry's appetite for what RFID can bring 
is a lot greater. There's a better understanding of what it does and how it works and exactly how it can help businesses. And, and mainly because you start to introduce sensor types, right? We talked a little bit about sensor technology and how that can be used to help your business. And RFID is really the first area in which sensors are available for reading, right? So remember, we go back to our questions, right? How does it communicate? Well, it communicates via RFID. What does it communicate? Well, it communicates what the sensor is reading, right? It also communicates numbers and letters similar to a barcode. Uh, with RFID, it is a passive tag. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. So active tags are available. In our experience in the industry, the appetite for active tags really isn't there. Um, there's not really there's not really a benefit that it provides that's so so much greater than passive to where people are really making that decision to go to the active route. A lot of the manufacturers are not even really doing much with active RFID these days, mainly because um, our third tag type, Bluetooth, has proven itself to be a better option. But it is a passive tag. And the way that RFID works is that um, when a scanner sends out a scan, in that radio wave, it contains enough power to power the tag up long enough to report its information and send it back to the scanner. And so it is a passive tag in the sense that it doesn't have a battery and that the scan itself is what powers it up to read the information. The pros for RFID, they are very easy to read. Um, if you've never seen an RFID example, you can take a handheld, um, imagine I have a handheld scanner and I've got you know tags around this room. I don't know how big this room is, probably about you know, maybe eight by 10. Uh, that, that's probably a good, uh, a good guess. But uh, if I were to hold down my, my scanner, I could pick up 50 tags in less than a second, right? You could pick up hundreds of tags in less than a second. It's a very efficient technology for reading a lot of things in a short amount of time. And you can experiment with, I don't want to go too deep into the science because there's probably better webinars for understanding radio waves if you want to get into that. But uh, if you get into the science of radio waves at a, at a basic level, the, the gain setting of the radio wave is something that you can configure to read things from further away or to make, thing, to make your read range more limited. And there's use cases for both. If I was doing inventory and I wanted to scan as much as I could without having to move as much as possible, I'd probably want my gain setting pretty high because I, I want that wave to be powerful enough to travel and scan a bunch of tags. But if I'm looking for something specific or I'm trying to just read what's in my immediate vicinity, I would maybe want my gain setting a little bit lower so that I'm not reading things far away, right? And so that's one of the many pros. You have access to you know, configuring your read range. They are very easy to read. And this is, again, where you start introducing the sensor types that you have access to. For the cons on this section, I, I debated even actually putting these in because these aren't even really cons with RFID. They're not cons with RFID tags. They're just limitations of radio waves, right? Um, they are limited by metal, liquid, and other impedance. So the example I like to use is uh, imagine a big metal shipping container. If I needed to go inside the shipping container and scan everything that was in it, I would get great read accuracy because metal metal is a well let's put it this way a radio wave bounces off of metal and amplifies so if i get inside that little metal container that radio wave is going to bounce all over the place and scan everything right but it does not penetrate metal so i can't be on the outside of the container trying to scan what's on the inside because metal blocks 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 weight radio waves that was a tough one uh, same with same with liquid, right? You can't radio waves can't penetrate through liquid. Um, it's just again, it's not even really a, a a con of RFID. It's just a limitation of radio wave technology, right? So, like I said, I kind of debated having cons in there at all because you you really can't complain about science, right? It is what it is. So, uh, moving on, let's talk about Bluetooth low energy. So BLE. Uh, like I mentioned, this is really the, the replacement for active RFID that we have seen 
Um, and Bluetooth is another technology, like I mentioned, that people understand. Uh, we have it in a lot of our devices that we use today. And uh, there's not really a lot of explanation that you need to do uh, when you're talking about Bluetooth. I mean, you create a pairing, you share data. It's as simple as that. And this is considered beacon technology. So it'll essentially send its information out on a defined time frequency. Uh, depending on the type of Bluetooth tag you use, you have, you have a, a minimal level of control on how often that thing broadcasts out, right? Typically what we've seen and what we've done uh, with our deployments is we like to keep ping frequency or broadcast frequency between you know, three to 10 seconds, if possible, because once you get past 10 seconds, you're not really getting real-time information. And that's kind of another discussion, right? You, your ping rates essentially determine how close to real-time you want to get. However, there's, a, there's a, a scale on ping frequency and battery life, uh, battery life usage, right? If I'm pinging every second, I'm going to drain that battery a lot quicker. Remember, this is an active tech. There's, a, there's an onboard battery. I personally have never seen uh, Bluetooth tags with rechargeable batteries. That doesn't mean they're not out there. They may not be as popular as just the replaceable batteries, but a lot of what we deal with are those replaceable batteries that are like, uh, like a watch battery, like a nickel battery. Um, but other tags have batteries that can't be replaced. And once the tag dies, you toss it, right? And obviously when you start talking about uh, the cost of the tag, you know, the battery plays a huge role in how much the tag uh, costs. But remember how we talked about in that first graphic of active tags, right? It is an active tag, but it does not communicate directly to the cloud. It still needs something in the middle there to, to relay that information to the cloud. Uh, you also get opportunities or um, configurations for various sensors. So again, we talk about, you know, things like uh, uh, temperature, light sensitivity, things of that nature. Um, one example that I like to use for Bluetooth and, and a very common example are things like uh, tiles or air tags, right? These are Bluetooth tags that people are using to track, you know, things that they may lose frequently, like their wallet or their keys or, or something of that nature. So that's a good example of Bluetooth technology at work um, in the marketplace today. And the pros for this tag, again, we talked that it is active, it's battery powered, right? They do have uh, they do have sensor compatibility. It's a trustworthy technology. The signal is a lot stronger than RFID. Um, the way that I like to explain that concept is: imagine you have a friend that lives two hours away. It's better for both of you to meet in the middle and drive an hour than for you to drive two hours away, right? That's the way that Bluetooth works as well. If Bluetooth is going, if Bluetooth is meeting in the middle versus going all the way over you're gonna have better read accuracy and more read strength, right? RFID, because it is passive, is just kind of sitting there waiting to be scanned. Whereas Bluetooth is actively going out and, and saying, here I am, you know, find me. Uh, the cons for Bluetooth, they are readable by other Bluetooth radios. So when we talk about radios, your, your phone has a Bluetooth radio. It's what gives you the ability to make Bluetooth connections. And the way that we at Atricity have solved this problem, at least in our customer deployments, is that we, we filter based off of a unique identifier that's built into the tag, programmed into the tag itself. Um, if you think about, if I were to just do a Bluetooth scan, just a generic Bluetooth scan with no filtering, I'd probably pick up 100 things right now, right? There's, there's Bluetooth radio in the laptop that I'm using, in the phone that we're doing the camera on, there's Bluetooth in the microphone that I'm using. So if I was trying to scan, you know, my important assets and inventory without a Bluetooth filter, it would be useless. I'd have so much junk data that doesn't make any sense to me. So what we've done on the electricity side is we have um, a unique identifier that we that we configure into the tags, and then in the system we basically say only look for tags that have this unique identifier. And so that way, that's how we're that's how we're filtering out you know everybody's phones and headphones and stuff like that. Um, they are readable by other Bluetooth radios, but if you think about it, there's not really much data that people can get from that, right? I mean, I could see that this MAC address is reporting this temperature. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me unless I know what that tag is on. And that's the information that gets stored in the cloud. So again, kind of a con, it's, it's good to know because it is broadcasting, right? And I know that there's been uh, advancements made in, in encrypting some of that, that, uh, that message that does get sent out. 
Um, but it, it's good to know it is readable by other radios. Um, but to an extent, there's not really much that anybody could gather from that information unless they knew what that tag was associated with. Moving on, uh, we talk about LTE and cellular. And I have cellular on here because uh, a lot of companies are starting to certify these types of tags on the 5G network. Um, you'll see if you were to use these tags, uh, they have 3G and 2G fallback. And basically the way that these tags work is you put a cellular SIM chip inside the tag and this is how it directly connects to the cloud. So you get one of these tags, you, you put in a SIM chip from you know, someone like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile Sprint, one of those, and then it operates very similar to your phone. Um, it has a data plan and we could talk a little bit more about that, but uh, it just immediately connects itself to the cloud and reports its information. Uh, the sensors that you typically see on these tags are GPS. Uh, these are great for putting on an item that maybe is in an open area. Like the example I like to use is if you're on a construction site that's that can span, you know, miles, uh, it's way easier to just have a tag that has its GPS coordinates or that's sending its GPS coordinates instead of having to go manually look for it everywhere. Um, this is also a great example or a good tag to use for expensive equipment because you want to know where it's at at all times. And if it's moving without authorization, um, you know, you, you want to be able to track and see that, you know, Hey, this is moving, right? I don't want, I, I don't want it to, uh, I don't want it to get out of my, my span of control. Um, the pros of these tags, they do report direct to the cloud. There's no need for a scanner or a gateway, right? These are often built in a ruggedized enclosures, So they're meant to be out. They're meant to be, um, you know, used in, you know, remote environments, but that also brings in one of the cons. Um, you're limited to areas where there's data coverage. You have to have cell coverage um, in order for these tags to function correctly. They also have monthly data plans. Now, if you remember back in the old days before everybody went to unlimited data plans, uh, these tags do have monthly data plans that you have to pay. Now, that may not be a big deal. I think when we start talking about, I have a slide basically devoted to budget, but when we start talking about budget, budget's completely subjective to how much money you're willing to spend, but also the value of your assets, right? If, if you're tracking a million dollar tool, you're not going to worry about paying 20 bucks a month to make sure that thing is tracked, right? Or whatever the price may be for the data plan. So when we look at the monthly data plans, uh, we've started to see some, some companies offer unlimited data as we are with our cell phones. Um, Typically, you still see more of the, you know, the uh, confined data plans. And then when you get into that, you, you kind of have a similar discussion that you had with Bluetooth, which is the more I ping, not only am I draining my battery now, I'm also incurring more data charges, right? So there is that spectrum that you need to be aware of. If you want real-time information about this tag, you are, you're going to pay for it. And again, it's not that much, but um, you just need to be aware that you need to have a data plan that can support that amount of data being transferred back and forth. Final tag, we have our satellite tag. And this is the most expensive, but it also, it works anywhere on the globe. Um, for those who are unaware of how GPS technology works, we have satellites that orbit the globe and they read your phone or they read, you know, your car navigation. And that's how it can tell where you're at, right? These are also active tags uh, and they connect to the internet using satellite technology. So there is not a place, I, sh I shouldn't say that because I haven't been everywhere on the globe. There, you'd be hard pressed to find a place where these tags don't work on the globe, right? Maybe the North and South Pole, I'm not sure how that would work, but uh, now you're talking more about like electricity and magnetics and stuff like that. Um, but virtually it's gonna work anywhere on the globe, right? Uh, GPS sensors are most common with these tags. We see these in use with things that travel around the globe, right? Because you can't rely on cell connectivity around the globe. Um, cell towers may not always be, you know, the same in the United States as they are in, you know, in Europe or, uh, you know, South America or other continents. So talking about the pros, guaranteed connectivity, very reliable you know you're going to get a reliable tag here. And that's not to say that the other tags are not reliable, but like I said, um, you're kind of limited to, you know, cell coverage when you talk about LTE or cellular tags. And then the cons, it is the most expensive. But again, like I mentioned, 
all the tags are, you know, their pricing is completely subjective. It's completely subjective to your budget. But this is objectively the most expensive of the tags you can buy. So that concludes the five tag types. Let's talk about budget because I do think that that's important. And the key, the key thing that we like to say here at Electricity is that the tag should always be based on the value of what you're tracking. Uh, it does not make sense to put a $100 tag on a $5 item. You would never do that, right? It also doesn't make sense to put a barcode on a $100,000 item. You need more information about those items. And so you need to have a tag that makes sense for the item that you're tracking. And so we have a couple examples here that I wrote up. Example one, I'm, I'm responsible for tracking a $50,000 piece of construction equipment. I want to know the location of the equipment without having to drive around to find it. This is a huge, this is a huge use case in the construction industry, We're tracking yellow iron, things that are very expensive. Uh, we would recommend an LTE or cellular tag for that because it can give you GPS information. It doesn't need a scanner in order to report. It just reports directly to the cloud and you're good to go. Uh, example number two, I'm tracking boxes of PPE at my warehouse. I need to know how many I have on hand without relying on manual counting. We'd recommend an RFID tag for that. Because like I mentioned earlier, you can scan a lot of RFID tags in a short amount of time. And if you're doing inventory on, on boxes of you know, consumable inventory, the best way to do that is to do it through RFID. You probably don't need an LTE or satellite tag because those, those boxes aren't worth that much, right? Then example number three, I'm tracking aviation equipment across the globe. I need a tag that can track it in real time. That's where we would recommend satellite because it's, it's the most reliable. You're not constrained to, you know, passive technology or constrained to areas where you have LTE or cellular connectivity. This is going to work and it's going to track across the globe. There are multiple other examples of, of how pricing should dictate how you track certain items. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the, you know, how radio frequency works, how, how a lot of these signals um, work. One of the things that we didn't mention, and, and we actually will probably talk about this uh, more at length in the next webinar when we talk about indoor positioning, is that GPS typically doesn't work inside. Um, and if you want a quick example of that, if you're in a building right now or you're, you know, you're at home or wherever you're at, pull up your phone, go to Google Maps or you know, Apple Maps or whatever you use, and watch your dot on your phone move around sporadically. It's because you're in an enclosed building and it, it obviously depends on, you know, how close to the window you are or, you know, like myself right now, I'm on the fourth floor of a, you know, of an office building and I'm pretty close to the window. So maybe I'd get decent, you know, GPS uh, reliability. However, if you're in the middle of a building, maybe you're in the middle of a warehouse, GPS isn't going to work because it can't find those, those satellites. There's too much impedance, right? We mentioned that a little bit. So we'll talk about that more at length when we talk about indoor positioning, but there are specific use cases in which each of these tags would be recommended and where each of these tags would shine. So with that in mind, uh, we always encourage the people that we work with to, to ask questions, but we also encourage a, a site visit to, to understand what are, you know, what's your environment like? Are you outdoors? Are you indoors? Are you tracking metal items? Are you tracking liquid items? There's a bunch of questions that we ask and that, helps uh, you know, companies like us to understand how to make the best suggestion for your use case. The other side of this too is that a lot of these solutions are very much centered on one tag technology. They're not, they're not a solution that can span all, all of these tag types. Uh, but what we do at Aptricity is we, we do work with all of these tag types. So you don't have to, you know, be forced into an RFID tag when maybe the scenario isn't best for it. Um, we work with all these different tag types. So you're getting a solution that's fit to your environment. You're not having to make your environment fit our solution. And that's what kind of having the freedom of these five different tags and integrations with all of them, that's the freedom that it gives you. So with that in mind, We've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, I think that's plenty of time to answer a few questions. So uh, we will open the chat. I'm, uh, I'm looking through it right now. So if you have questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I know that that was a lot of talking from my end. So 
I'm going to take a drink of water. I will uh, start reading your questions and then we'll start addressing some of these. And we'll do this for about maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay, first question. Are any of the tags reusable? That's a good question. Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the difference between passive and active actually plays a role here because we talked about with Bluetooth how some of them have replaceable batteries and some of them don't. So the ones that have replaceable batteries are obviously reusable. Uh, I've been asked before, well, can I use reuse RFID tags? And we typically don't recommend it because once you, it's just, think of it like a barcode, like a label, right? You're slapping a label on, on a box, right? It's hard to peel that off and reuse it, right? And RFID is so cheap that you may, you know, it's, it's easier to just print a new one than it would be to reuse an old one. Um, so things like passive tags, I, we would definitely say we don't recommend reusing them. When you get into Bluetooth, really the, the deciding factor is, is the battery replaceable? Uh, if yes, then they are reusable. If no, no. Um, and then with uh, satellite and LTE GPS, we absolutely would say that those are reusable. So if you, you, know, if you need to transfer that tag from one item to another, that's easy to do. Good question. Okay, got another one here. Uh, who would be responsible for tagging my items? That's another question that actually we get pretty frequently. So it really depends on where you're at or what kind of business you are, right? Because we, uh, in our Verizon use case, a lot of the items that get sent to their warehouse get tagged with RFID before they ever get to the warehouse, right? So where in your supply chain you have the most control really gives you the answer to that question. So if you're a smaller business and as things come in that you want to track, um, our mobile app gives you a quick and easy ability to associate a tag with an asset or an inventory item just by doing a couple of scans. So, you know, if you have existing asset or inventory records in your system and you're wanting to put tags on them, that's something you could do it at that point. Um, you could do it at the point where things are being, you know, delivered to a shipping dock. You know, you're putting tags and saying this tag equals this product. Um, if you have control to do it at the manufacturing side, um, that's also possible. I, I know that um, in certain use cases with Verizon, they have enough, you know, sway with their manufacturers to say, you're going to build this with an RFID tag already in it, and then send us a list of those tags and what products that they are um, associated with. So really, you can do the tagging at any point, just as long as, you know, obviously, if you're putting something in the field, you typically want to tag it before it goes out, right? You don't, it's, you can certainly do it while it's out in the field, but it does make a little bit more sense to have it in the central location before you send it out. Good questions so far. Let me take another drink of water. It's hot here in Texas. <laughs> okay, here's another one. How far can you read Bluetooth tags? So this operates similar to, uh, to RFID in the sense that you can control the gain. To, to some extent, you can control the game. And really what I should say is that there's a lot of different Bluetooth tags out there. So what I'm saying is not universally applicable. You, you kind of need to figure out at the tag level um, what you can and can't control. The tags that we use uh, and the tags that we manufacture, you can control the, you know, things like the ping rate and uh, the gain and, uh, you know, uh, what's being communicated. Uh, but at Tricity, if you're familiar with what we do, we have tags that can read up to 23 miles, um, which is pretty incredible. And I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it myself, um, but it, it can, I, I promise you that. Um, one of the other things too is, you know, there's not a lot of use cases maybe in your business for 23 miles of, of line of sight, but that same power can penetrate through floors of a building, right? So we can go anywhere between, at Tricity, 23 miles to you know, a few meters, right? So it depends again on how, you know, the, the battery life of the tag and the strength, you know, how, how, much, how much strength the battery has to be able to send that signal out. And then how big the data package is. Because if you have, you know, if you're sending temperature information as well, uh, that's a bigger data package. So you can't send it as far. You know, if something's heavier, you can't throw it very far, right? That's, that's probably not the greatest example, but <laughs> I, think it, I think it works for this sense. 
Okay, we've got another one here. Uh, how do data plans work for LTE and cellular tags? Are there special rates? I kind of went into this a little bit. Um, I'll go into a little bit more in detail, but typically what you, if you go to your major, if, if you're US based, of course, uh, you would go to your major cell providers, people like Verizon, AT&T, um, you know, T-Mobile, Sprint. Um, I always have to say T-Mobile, Sprint because I forgot that they merged. But uh, typically they'll, they'll do it more like the old, you know, the older data plans where you buy maybe a two megabyte data plan or you're buying a, a defined amount of data. Like I mentioned, they're, you're starting to hear a little bit more about companies that offer unlimited data plans or SIM chips that aren't specific to one company. Um, there's this, uh, this product coming out that allows you to connect to any type of cell tower, which is really fascinating. We're keeping an eye on that. Um, but typically what'll happen is you'll just pay that as a monthly charge as part of the tag. Um, the customers that we work with who utilize this technology that just kind of gets rolled into um, part of their payment on a monthly scale is if you've got this many tags and you're just paying a monthly rate. Um, there are data overages. And so that's really where we, where it's valuable to work with you and your use case to say, you know, here's how many pings we're doing a day. That's going to equal this much data. We recommend this data plan. Well, if you want to go, you know, move beyond that, then we would recommend this data plan. So those are the types of things that we kind of, we cover on maybe an implementation call or something like that. All right, let's do this last question and then we'll go ahead and, and wrap this thing up. Are there best practices for placing tags on items? So we talked a little bit about this um, when we were mentioning, you know, where in the supply chain is it best to tag items. Uh, but when we start talking about the different tag types, if we're talking about RFID, right, we mentioned a little bit about metal and a little, a little bit about liquid. So if you are tracking those types of things, there are best practices for things like foam backing to give it just a little bit of a rise off of the metal so that you can still use RFID to track metal. Um, the same concept applies for liquid. If you just get it a little bit off of the metal or liquid, you can still read it, right? Um, for other things, like if you're tagging boxes, you just want, you want to make sure that tags are externally available. You can put things on the inside of a box, but just remember when you're when you're talking radio frequency, you you start bringing impedance into the discussion. The more things that get in the way, the harder it is to read, right? For things like Bluetooth tags and uh, maybe LTE tags, those are in you know uh, enclosures that are a little bit bigger. So one of the things that we that we've dealt with some of our customers is, well, how do I non discreetly put these things on items so that my customer, not my customers, but my employees don't take them off or, you know, cause they, you know, theft is a big issue, right? And if I know that there's a tracking tag, I'm going to try to discreetly take that tag off and throw it away or, you know, get rid of it. And so there are ways to, you know, discreetly build those into, you know, an enclosure that maybe looks like part of whatever you're tracking that, that does tend to be based on what it is exactly you are tracking. So for something like a bulldozer, you know, maybe, maybe you're putting that, well, I don't know the anatomy of a bulldozer super well, but um, you would want it to be in a place, really the, the main concept, the main takeaway from this is you want it to be in a place that has direct access. You don't want it to be impeded by metal or, or liquid, like we mentioned. And uh, if, you're, if you're doing it for things like boxes, you want it to be in a place where you're not stacking them on top of each other, because that can, that can also impede scanning. So again, uh, I know I've used this... Um, this this phrase a lot, but uh, it's it's entirely dependent upon your use case. But there are best practices in terms of how to store items to make sure that tags aren't stacked on on top of each other. There's ways to use metal to your benefit, um, and there's ways to get around some of the limitations that that come with the uh, you know just come with the science of radio wave technology. Well, great. Those were great questions. Um, thank you to all who typed up answers or not answers, uh, questions. Um, good feedback from, uh, from today's session, but uh, that will basically wrap up today's session. Um, just again, I'm going to go back to uh, my second slide here that kind of talks about the future sessions just to give you a refresher on that. There we go. 
So like I mentioned, today was session one. Uh, session two will be in two weeks on July 27th. Like I mentioned, all sessions will be on Wednesday at 1030 Central, and they'll run for roughly an hour. I think we're, we're, we're doing good on time. I, I didn't want to go over today because I know that we've all got busy schedules. But um, the next session will be the 27th. We'll be talking a little bit about indoor positioning, what you need to know. Uh, the session after that will be August 10th. We'll be doing an industry spotlight on indoor positioning. It's basically talking specific to the industry, how that solution can help. And then session four, making sense of supply chain tracking technologies. We'll kind of wrap up, you know, everything that we've talked about in the previous three sessions. Uh, maybe be, make it a little bit more personalized to some of the questions that you would have. And uh, just talk about how these things can help. I think today was probably a good primer on how the tags work and what they can do. Uh, session four, we'll talk a little bit more about solutions. And how and how they can directly help your business. Uh, but with that in mind, we will go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. I want to thank you guys again for joining. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to reach out to myself. Um, my email is cgarcia at aptricity.com. We'll have other uh, other people here on the team that will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, you can visit our website, fill out a contact form if you want to learn more. We've got uh, written collateral that we'd be happy to share with you if we can get a little bit of contact information and we will be uh, we'll be prepping for this next one. So if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out. We're here to help you guys out. So thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and hopefully we will see you again in two weeks. Thank you everybody.